Tom Moran from the Star Ledger editorial board. I'm here with Jim Johnson, Democratic candidate for governor, uh, who has qualified for matching funds and will be in all the debates. Uh, so let me start just uh, by rattling off a little bit on intro. Uh, former federal prosecutor, under Secretary of Treasury under President Clinton, partner at Deborah Wiz and Clinton, one of the top firms, chairman of the Brennan Center for Social Justice Center for Justice, mm -hmm. which is a group that works on. For those who don't know, campaign reform, the workings of democracy, and they're one of my favorites. I love them. Thank you for that. But no experience in elective politics, which means, from my point of view, it's hard to judge where your real priorities lie because you can present a list of 10 things you want to do, and we don't really know what is top one or two. Mm -hmm. We also don't know how you'd be effective in working with legislatures. So let's start there. Why should voters be taking a risk on someone who's never been in elective office? I haven't been in elective office, but I have been in big offices. When I was in the Clinton administration, I oversaw 29,000 people. I was responsible for presidential security, security of our borders, safety in our streets, and I had to work to balance budgets. I was responsible for a budget of $4.6 billion. Um, that's a lot of responsibility, and actually no one in the race has had that sort of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Uh, two, in terms of legislators, I've worked not only with the um, federal legislation, uh, with the Congress um, to push through legislation, but I've worked in New Jersey on some tough issues like racial profiling and was able to bring together civil rights community and law enforcement to develop a legislative package that is still in effect today, and that's the New Jersey Police Standards Act of 2009. Big changes. What um, technically was your role in the racial profiling? Um, ten years ago, now more than that. The state troopers were accused of profiling African-American young men and Hispanic young men on the turnpike primarily. Uh, they were subject to a federal consent decree. That decree was in place for about 10 years. And Governor Corzine had to decide whether or not to move to have the troopers released from those terms. He wasn't going to do that without citizen input. I led the citizen panel. Um, my firm helped do the work. We actually put in probably about a million to a million and a half dollars worth of time and effort to hold hearings across the state. And my role was to lead that effort and bring it home. Okay. And the federal monitoring has ended and most people say the state police has been permanently improved. Do you share that? The monitoring ended, um, improvement has been terrific, but it's nothing is permanent. It requires constant vigilance and one of the key um, changes that we made sure was in place was for the video cams and cars to be uh, s something that's permanent, for the reporting on, of the data on the stops to be permanent, because nothing can be taken for granted ever. So Attorney General Jeff Sessions, Trump's guy, mm -hmm. now saying we want to stop doing these decrees, and as you know, there's one in place in Newark right now. So that's real crazy talk, I suppose, from your point of view. From my perspective, there are a couple of things that are, that are crazy talk coming from Attorney General Sessions. and. Um, there's actually a video of me testifying before him when he was in Senate more than almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, he and I have crossed swords before, and I would suppose as governor we'd cross swords again. Um, he has been talking about returning law enforcement to um, a disproved theory of fighting for a war on drugs, of um, simply being tough on crime rather than smart on crime. It has been wasteful of money. It has been wasteful of lives. And it's something that we shouldn't turn to, um, return to. Um, and so I've listened to the, to the Attorney General. I thought he was wrong 20 years ago on a lot of issues. I think he's wrong now. And I think that law enforcement has moved to a place where his ideas are will seem like old, bad news. Okay. Um, let's talk about New Jersey policy. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a, a 49 page, I think, list of your policies. And that was either to us or the website, but that's in depth. But let me start with this. New Jersey's fiscal crisis is the thing nobody wants to talk about and from mm -hmm. what it seems to me. There's no way this works for the left or the right. For people in the Democratic Party, you can't do things like major initiatives on housing or all, you know, uh, universal kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything progressive until we solve the fiscal crisis. So tell me, first of all, what spending you would cut. Well, there, there's spending, there's a spending to be cut, but there's also, um, honestly, revenue enhancements that we have to have. Right, but I right. want to know about the spending cuts from Democrats first. Okay, so I've already proposed um, two things on the property tax area. One is that we, we have 565 municipalities. Um, we have only a handful of shared services agreements. That is extraordinarily wasteful, and we are not getting the services um, that we need to get. 
Uh, and so I would be moving towards more shared services agreements, which is a, which is going to necessarily lead to a cuts um, in spending. Um, we have talked, I have talked about money that we're not getting back uh, from Washington um, that we have to get. From the public records, we've identified over $1.3 billion over seven years that should have come back to New Jersey. My sense is, is this, this is going to be an area where it's a gift that can, is going to keep giving uh, because the federal funding streams have been some funding gets cut off because of the way we structure our contracts. So our no-bid contracts leads to um, a problem with um, a problem with federal grants. Um, our decisions to use contractors for certain highway projects um, rather than state employees also can lead to and has led to a loss of federal funds. I haven't been able to quantify it yet, but it's those sorts of practices which goes to the heart of my ethics reform that also off also cost the New Jersey taxpayers, and so I would like to end those. I'm sorry. Um, if you do consolidation, I, I first need to say that for a generation everyone's been saying this, and some have done it, and the savings have been modest, and mm -hmm. that's saving to local government so it doesn't address the state's fiscal crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, claiming more federal money sounds great, of course, but again, that's something I've been hearing for 30 years from everybody. I want you to dig into the meat mm -hmm. of you as governor, the budgets you'd have to sign, what would you line item out? And I want to start with public workers, mm -hmm. because as you know, the governor's bipartisan commission, mm -hmm. co-chaired by Tom Byrne, the former Democratic State Commission, yep. said we cannot get through this crisis without a second round of significant cuts in public worker benefits. No Democrat seems to be climbing on board with that idea because you guys need the support of unions to win in November. Mm -hmm. How do you cut spending and do you favor any cuts for public workers? Well, there are a couple of different things we got to do. Uh, first, um, with respect to with respect to pensions, and then there's there's benefits as well. So, putting health benefits to the side, but with respect to pensions, I do believe that we can honor existing um, commitments to our employees, but that going forward, we're going to have to look through to restructure how these packages are put together because it is not it's not sustainable. So, a different deal for <coughs> new hires. For new hires. Okay. Yes. What about health? The, the commission, and I think many experts who have looked at this, said the real savings is in health care. The public workers in New Jersey get very generous plans that would qualify as platinum coverage mm -hmm. under Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has to be scaled back. The mm -hmm. unions are resisting that. They're tweaking, making some constructive tweaks on this. Mm -hmm. and those. But would you say that, as the commission did, that we need to make some gigantic cuts in health care? They're talking about a billion dollars a year. Take that money and use it to restore the pension fund. Do you agree with that model? I, I believe the mod we have to get the math right. And I believe that the tweaks have been um, constructive, but it may not be far enough. And we're going to have to have serious conversations because our, our current fiscal state is not sustainable. Okay. And if we proceed from that moment, that point, then we're going to have to have some harder conversations where so their tweaks and the big cuts, where one lands between that. Um, I haven't come down to a solid point on that, but we have to have a hard conversation about that. Okay. And it's going to be hard for me as, as a, for someone running for governor to have that conversation and someone sitting in the governor's chair to have that conversation. But we have to do it. Right. Have you made that point to the state worker unions and NJEA? Um, I have raised that point. NJEA has already, had already committed to, to one candidate, and it's fair to say that our conversations have not been um, robust. Right. Okay. Um, education. You say you want to fully fund the formula that was passed in 2008, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court approved it, and we since then have tinkered and messed and distorted it. The big challenge, it seems to me, politically <coughs> in that is if you fix the formula and go back to the clean formula, Hudson County loses a ton of money. Jersey City mm -hmm. is the big loser, and Hoboken mm -hmm. is another one. How do you get through that political challenge? How, did, how does a Democratic legislature pass something that people in Hudson County are going to hate? People, but there are people in other parts of the state who are not going to, who are not going to hate. And there's going to have to be some, some hard back and forth over that. And one of the things, and I've not only called for fully funding the formula, but with respect to the millionaire's tax, I think that, that I'm prepared to, to return to some portion of the millionaire's tax, maybe not to the same high level, um, to provide funding for uh, not only the, the current formula. I, uh, but, but the millionaire's tax, everybody, even Jack Cittarelli on the Republican side favors, and that money has been claimed 10 times over. Yeah, but everyone has claimed it in different ways. Um, a governor has to set priorities. One of my priorities is education. That's one of my top priorities. And one of the areas within education that I think is vitally important is in the area of pre-K. And so I, we can't fully, f can't get there 
the day after tomorrow or even next year, but that's a goal for me, and looking at the millionaire's tax as a way to dedicate a funding stream towards that effort would be important to me. Okay. Uh, another thing that struck my eye on education is mm -hmm. you're for a charter school moratorium. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think the charter school movement has been successful in Newark and Camden? Mm -hmm. And words matter, and I've actually caused for a pause in the charter schools. Okay. Um, because one of the problems that I see in our policy development in the state overall is we typically try to solve like one problem in front of us at a time, rather than saying what are, what are the choices that we're faced with. There are terrific things that have come out of charter schools, and I think the initial um, effort in charter schools has been to use them as a laboratory to develop pa best practices and transfer those to the public schools. In some parts of the state, that hasn't worked very well. Um, and I want to focus, I, you know, as I want to fully fund the formula, and I want, want to move towards a space where we have pre-K universally, um, we can't do all of those things at once. And for me, the question is this. Let's, let's take the best of our learning from charter schools, and it has had a terrific impact on, on young people's lives. See what we can do to translate that to, to strengthen the public school system, but and not say, as some people have said, charter schools are bad. Uh, in Newark and Camden, mm -hmm. it seems to me they have embraced a lot of innovations mm -hmm. from the charter schools. Longer school days, Saturday sessions, mm -hmm. uh, smaller schools within schools that have certain characters and emphasis. Um, the superintendent in Newark, Chris Cerf, the former state commissioner, says mm -hmm. this has been very helpful mm -hmm. to the mainstream schools. So why the, um, why the objection that those innovations have not spread? Mm -hmm. Secondly, I don't, uh, th whether there are charter schools in a wealthy suburb with successful school districts is to me far less important than Newark and Camden. Mm -hmm. It's causing a sort of revolutionary change, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing all the Democratic candidates say, well, let's pause, let's not do it. I don't get that. Seems to me a progressive should be behind this movement in the urban centers. So you're asking a, a gubernatorial candidate about a statewide policy as and, and saying right. let's let's focus on these two areas. You know, in the first instance, we have to look at uh, at least from my perspective, we have to look at what our statewide policy is. And as I've said, I've been very careful in talking about charter schools around the issue of pause. Um, as opposed to simply saying there are moratorium, it's a very different disposition. So, let, as you schools. know, these charter schools tend to expand year by year, and their mm -hmm. students go with the expansion. Mm -hmm. If you stop that, if you do a pause, and a kid who is in sixth grade can't go to the seventh grade in that school, you go back to the public schools of the district. Would your pause cause that effect? There are two different. There are two different ways one can expand charter schools. One is to allow kids to mature within a system that they currently are, are um, learning in and thriving in. The other is to say we need to create more charter schools. I'm much more focused on the, the last, the second approach, okay. which is let's not create more charter schools, but I don't want to say to a child, um, um, you've, you've gone this far with the teacher that you know and the system that you know, and we're going to yank you out of that. That's, that's not been my, my focus. Okay. Um, last question is, just tell me where you think voters should say, okay, this way, Jim Johnson is different than the other Democratic candidates. I think there are at least um, uh, three different ways. Uh, one, in terms of experience. We have one person in the race who's actually overseen complicated agencies, um, who has done it successfully, who has had to balance budgets because that was the mandate of from, from on high. In New Jersey, we have to balance budget because it's a mandate of math. Um, <laughs> there's one person who's done that. There is, when you look at our proposals, the, one of the reasons that New Jersey is so in such deep trouble is that our democracy has failed. We have a governmental system that has completely um, collapsed, part of it is because of ethics, and part of it because there hasn't been a focus on what makes government effective. There's only one candidate who's come forward with an ethics, a comprehensive ethics proposal to deal with that, some of which can be done with a stroke of a, of a pen. And then when you look at some of my policies, for instance, on the issue of foreclosure, there's a significant difference between what I've proposed in terms of dealing with the, the trauma for families of, of, of foreclosure and what um, uh, two other candidates have proposed as well. Um, I would actually, uh, and I have proposed working with the families um, within our budgets um, to help them move from foreclosure Two of the candidates on the Democratic son, side have proposed something which is quite extraordinary to me, which is essentially trying to solve the affordable housing problem by taking advantage of the families whose homes are in foreclosure. That to me is upside down and backwards. And when people look at our policies, people look at my experience, people look at essentially the heart at the center of a lot of the policy, they're going to say, 
Jim Johnson offers something different. And the final, the fourth difference is this. I am, um, I've seen a lot in this state and on the way over, um, we passed City Hall. And as a kid, um, uh, my mother worked as a legal secretary in the academy building. Um, and um, I have seen this state grow, I've seen this state um, um, mature, and I've seen things, things that actually haven't changed over time, and I've been frustrated by that, about that. And I'll bring that heart and that experience to the job of governor. Um, and maybe someone can match that, but no one's going to surpass that. And I'd only add that you have the advantage of being good friends with Deval Patrick, who's probably the best governor in the country in recent years. So you got that. Thanks. It helps that's to be all a good time. student. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll dig into the foreclosure thing first, but that's our time for Facebook Live. So much for the theory that all politicians are knuckleheads. Signing off here from the Star Ledger Editorial Board. <laughs>